Buckle up, everyone. We're going to talk aliens, UFOs, ghosts, spiritual and paranormal. From all of the three moons, beyond your wildest dreams. Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Truth Seeker. This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. Excited, delighted to be with you guys again for another episode where we cover all things spiritual. Uh, have beautiful conversations with people from all walks of life, man. And so we've gotten to talk to some really cool people over the years. And today is no exception. It's going to be a good conversation. Make sure you guys hang out. Shout out to everybody who are already here in the chats, whether you're listening on uh, Facebook, uh, Periscope, YouTube, wherever you are, Twitch, DLive, shout out to you guys. If you have any questions or comments, make sure you post them in the chats and uh, we'll make sure to weave those into the conversations as well. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody supporting this work through Patreon. This is a listener supported, listener funded show. Doesn't exist without your help. So thank you for believing in this work. Uh, shout out to some of the latest patrons within the last week or so. Shout out to uh, Sick Mike. Thank you for coming on, brother. Donald Guffey, thank you. Seth Mamakovlich, thank you for coming on as well. And uh, Dusty Carpenter, thank you guys for believing in the work and joining the force. If you'd like to support, head on over to patreon.com backslash truth seeker there you get access to my entire discography of music you get access to our thursday night school of the mystics which is the community aspect of what we're building here it's uh we do guided meditations breath work and uh just join for open discussion with uh people and uh, a community that you can roll ideas off of that you uh will probably get excommunicated if you talk about this kind of stuff at your local church so if you're looking for like-minded group of people man make sure you check us out you get access to all that for a dollar a month or whatever you want to do there's different levels different tiers patreon.com backslash true seeker um also too still promoting this thing and i've been saying my new book for a long time uh it just turned one year old so my book has been out right over a year. It's done really well. Thank you guys for all of the support. If you do not have a copy yet, go to truthseeker.com, pick you up a copy. The audiobook's available for free. If you go to the link in the description, you can get that as well. Spirit Realm. Check it out. We have a couple of tickets left for our December re refresh, reset, and renew um, uh, co-ed retreat. 
so this is the first one that we're doing. It's been men's retreats up until this point, but my wife is joining with me and we're opening it up for men and women. We have a couple of tickets left. If uh, you want to get in on it, make sure you go uh, check out those tickets. It's uh, December the 12th in Mobile, Alabama. It's going to be really beautiful if you want to read up on that and what all we're bringing to the table. Uh, it's going to be a night and a day in the forest uh, doing cacao ceremonies, breath work, kundalini yoga, and uh, again, just that, conver that conversation with like-minded people, which is the best part of it in general. So go to truthseeker.com and check that out. Get access today. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump into today's discussion. Today, my guest is Steve Benitez. Steve, welcome to the Truth Seeker Podcast, my brother. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And uh, it's a great privilege to be with you all. Thank you, man. Um so we have a mutual friend who uh, I've, I've uh, grown in conversation with recently and, and I really look up to this brother, uh, Roy Peterson. And uh, he showed me your interviews and, uh, and, 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 you know, not just that, I fell in love with, with, with your work and just your ideas that you were bringing to the table about mindfulness and uh, mind, body, spirit, those kind of things. But, uh, you know, he, he really uh, insisted that I get you on because he really looks up to you and, 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 you know, really values your ideas and your friendship as well. So shout out to Roy Peterson for suggesting you to come on the show, man. Um, maybe some reflections on, on that talk with, with Roy back then, five years ago, I think it was. Yeah, Roy, Roy was asking me what, how I see uh, mindfulness in the body of Christ because... Uh, it's not something that word is not really used in the body of Christ. And, you know, my, my take was that you cannot be Christ unless you're mindful. And, and, and then, so he asked me to explain that. He said, well, do you, did you, do you think that Jesus practiced meditation? His whole life was one big meditation. <laughs> he was never out of the zone. He was always in the flow. Yeah. So, you know, just because they use different words, mm -hmm. flow, zone, meditation, you know, this is a big stumbling block to a lot of uh, Christians, unfortunately, because I think it's the missing link for the body of Christ. Yeah. You know, anything that uh, allows you to think more clearly or see more, see more clearly should be, you know, promoted. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, I always talk about like things that start what we call the secret place or these places of prayer and meditation yeah. and mindfulness where like there's a practice or whatever breath work those kind of things like you, when when he comes out of that when Jesus comes out of it and everything that happens is a result of what he was doing when the doors were, were closed and I think he was really really um, adamant about that and, and almost begging his disciples to like do the inner work and come away and turn off the devices or whatever the case is you know what I'm saying and and, and, and be in touch with God be in touch with yourself and so um, there, there's a, a distinction there, I think, and I, I kind of heard it just even listening to some of the, the uh, episode this morning, because I know Roy, I've just been able to see his journey, you know what I'm saying, coming out of what he has and journeying or whatever. But there is a distinction between like the Christians who would say like, Jesus is my savior and he did it all for me. And that's it. Like, as long as I believe in him, I put my faith and trust in him. I'm good. On the other hand, and, and, and that's that's Christianity for the most part. But this other idea of Jesus is like, no, you got to take up your cross daily. You have to love your enemies. You have to do the work, you know, to be my disciples, do what I'm doing. I'm trying to teach you to do what I'm doing. And, and then the Christians are like, no, he's enough. Jesus is enough. We don't need anything else. He's enough. And so, you know, he came to show us this example and that's been lost through religion and maybe not wanting to do the inner work, but I think there's like an awakening happen where people are, you know, looking back to the East, I would say, you know, where Christianity comes from. The, 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 the truth is now is that after you've been to church every Sunday for a year or two, when Monday comes, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you have to deal with real life situations. So although Jesus might be enough in a dogmatic way, but He's not really enough. Just believing in confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord is not going to deal with the noise that you have in your head. It's not going to deal with, you know, broken relationships. It's not going to deal with, you know, you moving further into a greater understanding of God. That's just the beginning steps. That's yeah. what people have to really understand is there's so many layers to the teachings of Christ that if you stop at any point, you're missing it. 
it's one eternal process. It's one continuous eternal flow. There's no stops in the presence of God. It's a continuous river, you know. So unfortunately, this is where I believe that dogma comes in and the life of God differ. Dogma puts a full stop. It says, we're here, this is it, this is a box. And suddenly you think that God is this box. And then suddenly he breaks you out of that box and you think, where am I again? And you start all over again, you know? Yeah, you could put so, a price tag on that box and sell it, you know? <laughs> like this is the formula, you know? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about this more with you, and we'll go deeper into this. But let's talk a little bit about your genesis, like what what got you into whether it would be spirituality, you know, uh, Eastern philosophy, meditation, MMA, and the things that that you bring to the table. What was your genesis that kind of opened up the the door for this uh, uh, deeper thought and self reflection? Well, look, I, in nineteen eight, look, I was doing martial arts from the age of eleven. I was a full full contact fighter, and at, when I was 19, I got to a point where I suddenly had to say goodbye to my teacher and I felt compelled that I needed to go and find someone else, okay? And so what happened is I, I did a fast because I was practicing fasting at the time and I suddenly had an impression of someone calling me from Holland. So I had this vision of this, uh, this mystical type female woman and, and so I said to my parents, look, I need to go to Holland. There's something pulling and calling me with no address. I'd never been outside of England before. I was only 19 at the time. I left and with, you know, within an hour of me arriving to Holland, I ended up at this uh, Indonesian restaurant inquiring about martial arts and it was closed. And underneath the actual restaurant was a shop that was selling ornaments. And I inquired and they said, no, we don't know what that martial art is. It was called Silat at the time. And as I went to leave the shop, one of the ladies was opening one of the flyers because it was early morning shop opening time. So she was opening up the mail and there was a flyer and it said, Guru Ma Prem, Penjak Silat, lessons. So she ran out and gave it to me and I rang this number. A woman got on the, on the <laughs> other side of the phone, right? And said, I've been expecting you. Wow. Now, look, that sounds strange. Yeah. So anyway, I, I got a taxi, went to her house and became her student and stayed with her until 2012. That's she died insane. in the year 2012. Now, she was a Javanese mystic who followed a philosophy called Gajawan, which is the mystical teaching of the Javanese, but had an encounter with Christ while she was in Samadhi meditation in the Indonesian jungles during the Japanese occupation. And so she was a warrior first, but she had a very, very intimate walk with Christ, really super intimate. Like, and so, you know, I just, I, I would wonder how she could do so many things. She, her school was right in the middle of a red light district. She was healing people. She had words of knowledge, words of wisdom, accurate prophecies. She used herbs, plants, medicines, she worked with animals. She could communicate with trees and plants, right? So I knew this couldn't be accessed unless you had this kind of union. So And, and so that's what I watched and observed and I stayed with. And so, um, yeah, that she became my teacher and I, follow, I followed her steps ever since. Wow. Man, so... You know, before that, what what was your religious upbringing? Because we, we're bringing Christ into this. You're talking about yeah. words of knowledge, so there's some idea of you know yeah. the Bible or Christianity. What, what's your Christ, your relationship? I was with... raised a Catholic. Okay. I, I, my parents are Spanish. They moved from southern Spain, and they moved to London. So they were very staunch Catholics. I went to two Catholic school, but I had look. I had I was kind of a free spirit when I was a kid, and any form of religion or Catholicism just didn't suit who I was you know I was a free spirit I love nature I love the wild so me and church never really integrated you know and 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 to be honest with you Derek when I went to Guru Mars and I settled learning this martial art I had to go to these esoteric classes and and, and when she started talking about Christ I, there was a block mm. my heart was cold because of wow. the Catholic upbringing yeah, right for sure for sure so she revealed this other side of Christ that slowly allowed me to come in. But at the same time, she would talk about Buddha as well. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't just like, 
okay, guys, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell type of thing. It was, it was all to do with forging a union, forming a union, you know, and, and that has always sat well with me because Guru Ma always used this, uh, this chapter, chapter 17, when Jesus said, but yeah. this is my desire that you may become one with the Father. And that was the foundation of her teaching, that scripture yeah. is the foundation. That sat well with me, man. Yeah, I think that's the core of Jesus's, you know, like his final prayer, like what I have for you. It's like to be one as we are one, you know, and maybe even move into that where Jesus says that I only do the things that I see my father doing. Like, like that's not just for Jesus, guys. Like that's that's all that's just prayer for us for that. We would, you know, be able to see what our father's doing, which is all of the alms, it's beautiful things, love, righteousness, caring and the things that Jesus did, you know, so that that we would do it. Um and it i feel like that's a currency when it comes to the esoteric philosophies and stuff like you know as far as love and faith and charity um for me is is a is a is a baseline for all of it for me to go deeper into all of that stuff um what were some of the the, the things early on that you knew that it was real like whether it was some of the, the experiences from your teacher or were you seeing that you can operate in it as well whether it's you know, having these, you know, philosophical uh, talks or just connecting yourself with the wind, with the air, um, with plants, animals, those kind of things that really made it real or, or at least made you want to explore deeper, like these profound moments. So for me, the turning point was this. I don't know if you've ever come across the film August Rush. I haven't. Right? It's, a, it's about a kid as a musician that has to find his parents and he's, li he's literally listening to his intuition, right? So for me, what happened was once I found this teacher, because I knew she was calling me, so, and once she materialized and I became her student, I knew that that experience, that experience alone meant there was more to life than what I was being taught. And I knew I accessed it from the inside. Yeah. And, it, and, and so I knew that there was a small still voice, that there was consciousness, that it was connected to the all. And from that point onwards, I just thought, you know what? There's more to life than this box that I've been taught. So I guess that was the turning point for me, you know. And um, what, what were some of the, the uh, you know, profound philosophies that you learned, like sitting in those esoteric studies, like for the first time? Um, what, what were some yeah. of the things that really blew your mind? And I know it's hard to pinpoint because eventually they all start kind of <laughs> melding together, you know, these one two teachings here well, no matter what it is you know you read some philosophies that just blow blow your mind and uh but what what does anything stand out for you early on yeah you know the the thing that really moved me the most was because i growing up as a catholic you hear the word sin all the time from yeah. the age of five you know you're a sinner right mm -hmm. uh and and you can't help it so you're, you're a sinner right from the beginning and you're just a kid growing up so one of the most profound things that Guru Ma taught was uh, from the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost sons, right? And this is what she said. She said that the, a coin has an image on it. So what Jesus was trying to translate and transfer was that humans had lost their true image and likeness, right? And that we were enough as we are. And that if you leave your enoughness, you're off another route. You're misaligned. And so she was the first person that told me, Steve, you're enough as you are. Just as you are, you're completely yeah. enough. And I was like, but, but I'm a sinner. No, 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 no. You're enough as you are. Now, look, that seems very simple, but it had a huge impact on me. Yeah. You know, because, you know, at school, you're an A or a B or a C, yeah. you're a D. You know, you have no concept of this when you're a kid growing up. You know, you wake up in this world and you're enough, but then all of a sudden you go to school and you're not enough. You know, you're a Spanish kid that's not quite English or you're a white kid that's not black enough or black enough or white enough or tall enough or big enough or athletic enough. So this, this lack of enoughness was like, for me, it was toxicity. It was driving me insane. So for a woman to say uh, that I respected enormously, hey, Steve, you know what? You're enough as you are. This kind of like, it settled my energies. Yeah, that's that's huge for a lot of people. And they come to that, 
you know, through different things. Or I think part of it's uh, the unlearning process. You know, you like you said, been told that you're a sinner or you even entering into Christianity for all the right reasons. And then you find out that, you know, that you have to perform. It's a religion and there's dogmas and there's tenets and there's things that you have to do to earn God's love. Or if you do these things, God rejects you and doesn't love you or, or whatever God it is your, or tradition. You know, God still may love you, but your tradition hates you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Whatever the case is. And people have to deal with that. And then to like even transcend that, to sit in, to know that I'm loved regardless of anything that I do. You know, that enables you to do more, you know, to be more loved and to, and to pay it forward and, and to show people, introduce them to that that love what are some of the the, the practices that that you would do to uh, or still do to uh, to maybe engage i know roy in his interview talks about practicing the presence or whatever but like you know ha- have these different practices that we do to be mindful right because it was so easily this world is designed to take that away from us and have us in our job or have us in our doubts or uncertainties but through MMA, right, and I think that there's some spiritual practice in there with it, you know, uh, mind, body, spirit, devotion, and those kind of things. What are some of the techniques that you do to kind of be reminded or to even sit in the oneness of it all? You know, for, for me, my main practice, if I want to call it a practice, is uh, letting go, right? So what, what I mean by that is tapping into the force that's already existing. So, you know, like when you observe your brain, it formed by itself your eyes formed by itself, your heart organ formed by itself. So when I, when people, you know, they ask me, Steve, do you practice meditation? I practice existing. And that existence happens by itself. So, you know, when you sit in stillness, you're sitting in the force of that which is already happening. So I don't have to do anything. If, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. It's a complete let go rather than me trying to do anything. Yes, for sure. Yeah. At the same time, of course, I practice a very mystical dance called Kambangan, which is a, it's a Javanese dance specifically uh, constructed to form a union with nature. Earth, fire, water, air, the elements, the trees, the plants. So from that stillness comes a union. And, you know, when I see, when I see God, like the gospel of Thomas says, split the rock, there I am in the middle. When I'm doing sila, I feel one with the tree. I feel one with the wind. You know, I feel one with the sun. I feel one with the universe. And, and then developing that oneness into a union, forging into a, a relationship. Look, a lot of guys that know me will tell you, a lot of my students will tell you, look, recently I, I was just catching a flight to Italy and suddenly I, fe- I had this sense of a student of mine was going to have a car accident. And I rang him and said, listen, next time you get in the car, be aware, right? So anyway, that saved his life. It happened. And it, a Christian would call that listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So Umar would call that listening to the wind. So, you know, that for me, listening is everything. I, I, I see my whole body as a living antennae. Mm-hmm receptive yeah. and so the more i let go the more receptive i become the better i can listen yeah so i guess that's my practice yeah and it is you know and it's it's uh, interesting to explore that your hair being extensions of the central nervous system and like even the fact that you get chills when when something divine when you're in the presence right you get into that moment your body you know, can sense like an antenna, you know, these, these, uh, you know, miracles taking place around you, or you getting closer or coming to that revelation that you're close. Now let's talk about that. Like, are you getting closer? Or are you just, just becoming more aware of how close you are with the plant or with God or with the, 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 the breath, the fire, all of that stuff? Do you think that like you're doing the work to get closer or you're just like moving through these, these layers of perception of how close you are i think i think the second is probably closer i just i i feel that within every 24-hour cycle i don't chase anything so i'm it's, it's like i'm moving deeper into a an immersion of the presence and as that happens things are falling off that need to fall off 
and things are awakening. So I guess, I guess I'm not chasing anything. I guess I'm just flowing in the flow. Now, was and, there a, a moment that you did? Because a lot of us, we want to see signs, miracles, wonders. Like we want to see angels, aliens. We want to see this stuff to know that it's real. That there's a sp- like once we know it's real, then we have proof or whatever. But I think eventually, you kind of you know stop chasing those experiences or whatever. Is that kind of where you are now? You know, you know, for a while, I've, I'll be honest with you, Derek. I've been there for a while, a good while. I had an experience that took place in London, the streets of London, whereby an angel. Uh, I was, I was taking this uh, young lady home and I was at a bus stop and, and literally a 16 foot angel stood in front of me in daylight, which I could clearly visibly see and the girl could feel. And he said, follow those young guys. And I looked around, there weren't any young guys. And then all of a sudden, these six, seven youths passed me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ran across the road, took a sharp left. And by the time I got there, they had a they had a Nigerian diplomat at knife point, right? So anyway, when I got there, the angel followed me and said, lift your right hand. So I lifted my right hand and these youths were lifted in the air and thrown, okay? And uh, they ran, they scarpered. I took the guy, the guy's passport was on the uh, floor and his wallet and he was like really shooken up by this, right? So anyway, I took him up to his house, he called the police we were then taken to the police station, separated, and we had to write different reports. So his, <laughs> yeah, so his report was, I'm coming outside of my flat. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by seven guys. And I'm, I, he was a Christian, by the way. So he was calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what he said. And then he said, suddenly, this guy came. And this wind force, he described the wind force. Uh, and, and it saved his life. So look... I, was I chasing that experience? No. Was I open at the time that it happened? Yeah, I was available. And, you know, I don't think I'm any special for that, having that experience. I just feel that at that point, I was mindful. I was awake in the moment and someone was calling out and I was just there at the right time. So I've had many experiences like this, yeah. Derek, many like this, you know, especially in Indonesia where I trained for 11 years and was living in the jungles. You know, and I was I was encountering all different types of species, right? So I had to use my union, but I didn't chase it. You know, if, if I suddenly felt an, or- an orangutan came up to me and wanted to fight me because I was in his territory, <laughs> right? I would use I would use my union. And, and and of course, when there's an orangutan in front of you wanting to rip your head off, maybe you're at a different level of awakeness. So, you know, that I think has kept me in the dimension of what people call faith. Those little things that happen every day in my 24 hour cycle. Some seem big, some seem small, but they're all, they all add up, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The, uh, the patience and, and, uh, you know what I'm saying? Know how to connect with an orangutan that he doesn't destroy you. And I've I've heard many (laughs) stories similar, like, you know, to that. Um, snakes and things, people in the jungles in India and stuff like that, vipers raging up in their face. And for them, they rebuke them in Jesus' name. But it's just like, it's almost like I hit you with the power of love compels you or something, you know, whatever the terminology is that you use. Um, I find it interesting, you know, you have this this angel ex- ex- experience and I'm sure you've had more in all of these divine encounters, but like, and I know where you are today, it doesn't take an angel like to say, hey, Steve, follow me and go this way. Like it's the most that like following that, whether it's that still small voice within or just the integrity of, of now that you're alert and you can kind of read and discern what's even going on spiritually in an atmosphere, what people are intending. The Bible talks about how Jesus like was able to read people's hearts or read their mind. He knew their intentions. He knew they were going to try to to kill him. So he went the other way kind of thing. Um and it seems like, you know, for, for those who are chasing experience, like we, we're not going to go unless an angel comes and, and does it, right? But then you you become that angel in your everyday life for yourself or your family, for those around you. And, and then 
you see the magic in everything, right? It, it moves from like, like that experience was magical to like, no, when I sit and do a breath work, when I, when I let go of my fears and my doubts and my worries, that's more magical and powerful than knocking 50 people to the ground kind of thing. Yeah. I kind of explain it a little bit like, you know, I come from the charismatic background and the revivals and playing with that energy and knocking people down and shaking and crying and shouting and all of that. Like, I come from that. That's a beautiful experience to, to feel it for the first time, the first thousand times, whatever. I still feel that um, in the midst of a meditation, in the midst of breath work, um, I've learned to not be thrust back and fall on the ground and shake and cry for three hours. Hey, sometimes that happens, but like you can feel like the power of God, the power of the universe that you're, you're one with everything and still maintain your composure, breathe it in. And I, I even allow it to heal parts of your body and your psyche that, that needs help at that moment. You know, it comes all the power of like a charismatic movement, whatever your idea of spirituality is in the midst of a single breath. Powerful. That's powerful. You know, you know, um, I'm open to the presence like you are in anything. Yeah. I'm open to the presence of God speaking to me through plants, through trees, through animals. And then, you know, when I've spoken to Christians about this, they go, well, it's not biblical. And then I point them to the time that a prophet was rebuked by a donkey. Yeah. You know, we cannot limit consciousness. Mm -hmm. Cosmic consciousness cannot be limited by an experience or a dogma. You know, and I think I think for me that's been so I have a lot of beautiful Christian friends and they're lovely. But for me, sometimes, you know, these divisions that are very sad for me to see over 50,000 denominations. You know, and a lot of my Christian friends go from one church to another and one denomination to another, and they just keep swapping and changing. And I, and I always say, but guys, look, the fact that God loves you and you love him, that's enough. That's it. That's enough. That's enough. It's done. It's finished. You know, it's finished there and then it's finished, you know, and um, it's interesting because I, I honestly feel that if we box God, it's it, we're putting a full stop on our walk with God. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think maybe sometimes Christians are afraid to like try things like yoga, for example. Yeah. You know, or plants, for example. Yeah. When when John the Baptist was taking locust and honey. Which is, you know, which is very medicinal. The way that John the Baptist was eating was to do with his prophetic ability and prophetic calling. He didn't eat anything other than locust and honey. So you can clearly see that there were very specific practices that people like John the Baptist did. And yet nowadays, the church is close to these things. Mm -hmm. Maybe people like you can bring them back. <laughs> We're doing it, man. One podcast at a time. One everything we do breathes this stuff, man. And I'm intentional with it all. And it's working. It is working. Not just me, but everything like the people that I inspire and Roy, the work he's done, like it everything is coming full circle now. And there's there's an awakening happening and we just have to kind of be there to help cultivate it a little bit, to help encourage you're not alone. God loves you regardless of if your church doesn't or whatever the case is. And I'm seeing, a, you know, this, this awakening because it happened with me and it happened with you, you know. And so all we can do is be open and honest about our stories and help people get through some of the questions and, 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 and crazy stuff that comes along with it. Like to be, you know, hated by the people who once praised you is pretty, pretty depressing, man. You know what I'm saying? Because you, they found out that you're eating locusts and honey. You know what I'm saying? And they found out like, he's eating locusts and honey because he wants to be John the Baptist. Like, you know, these little things that, that happen in, in our Western culture. But uh, but it's definitely happening. Um, So let, let's talk a little bit about the... um. Um, your your school and, and, and MMA and things like that. So what do, what do you do? You do this per profession? You have students that you train in this? Yeah, yeah I've um, I've been lucky that I've uh, I've done this for over thirty years. So I, you know, I I teach all over the world. I have over a hundred instructors in different countries. Some in the US, you know, all over Europe, and they build schools. Um, and then I and then I run a, an esoteric school online as well. So it's not just the silat, the martial arts, it's the yoga, it's the therapies as well. So, um, yeah, doing seminars every weekend, online every other day. And this is all through the same website? 
It's all through the same website, yeah. It's all through the same website. And, and slowly but surely, I'm starting to document. This is a book that's out. Uh, that's, that's a picture of my teacher. So you can get all this stuff on, on, on the website. What's the site again? Go ahead and say it. We'll put it in the, sh- in the show notes. But it's at www.satriaarts.com. How do you spell it? S A T R A dash arts dot com. And is that is that the name of your uh, your school? Is that the name of the? Uh, That's the type name of, of the art. So the, the name of the yeah, it's Penjaxila is the general name, and Satria is the style of Penjaxila. Nice. And Pedro is an Indonesian martial art. Do you watch MMA at all? Do you watch UFC and those things? You know, do you know what I used to? I used to. It's become a little bit like a business now. Yeah. You know, I used to compete myself. So, you know, I've always loved sparring. Uh, you know, I, I've always loved competing. Now I'm 50. You know, it's a little bit different. My focus <laughs> is a little bit different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, it's just, you know, just ha- just. Ha- helping people have that awakening i guess like just kind of guiding them through it uh one thing you mentioned a while ago just um doing yoga you know trying something different you know but getting over the fear because there's so much fear that if i do yoga if i bend or stretch the wrong way a demon will inhabit my body like literally they believe this and so that's like a lot of you know unprogramming that you got to do but i think the biggest part of them do is to undo that is to simply try it like to try yoga for me doing yoga and kundalini yoga opened me up because i'm connecting with the same power that i experienced in those southern tent revivals the laying on of hands speaking in tongues of fire like i felt the same energy which we call the holy spirit or pranayama whatever in the midst of breath work and becoming one with my body and sun salutation like i'm i'm experiencing that same energy that loves me that heals me that is guiding me to this session and everything that i've done so just by simply stepping out and doing it you're gonna undo all of the years of false programming and fear that you've been that you've been perpetuating Mm. i think i think as well people have to look at the indoctrination of lucifer and satan Okay, because he he's in a lot of the Christian churches he's made omnipresent. Okay, yeah. and and you know either either Jesus destroyed the works of darkness or he didn't. You know, so you know it, Jesus said it is finished. Being I've done, it's finished. It's over. Walk in victory. Walk in my love, and that's it. And if that love is expressed through plants, wonderful. If it's expressed through yoga, wonderful. I, I am. I do think it's a lot to do with indoctrination, the fear. I really do. I think yeah. it's exhorting Lucifer in a position that he's not really at. You know, this planet is beautiful. This world is wonderful. You know, humans can have a wonderful life here on this planet. You know, so I think that once um, actually, there's a there's a scripture you might know it. It's in Revelations, and it says uh, that we Christians will say, "Was that him?" It's in Revelations, like, mm-hmm. is that is that the dude that's twisted all these guys up? Oh, yeah, yeah, him? yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Is, is that him? It's yeah. like, what? So, you know, I always look to the root of the thing. I do believe, you know, like a lot of my Christian friends that I say, look, hey, why don't you try this yoga class? It, it'll fix your spine. <laughs> no, I'd rather do Pilates. <laughs> but just try it. No, 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 no. Why? Well, you know, maybe uh, so the teacher's connected to some ancient demon. Yeah, you know, and I, and then I say, but doesn't it not say you shouldn't judge? You know, so it's, I don't know, man. I, you know, I have my view on this this whole indoctrination thing, and I think it's like duality. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like good and bad, and good and bad, and and it's like the tree in the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's good and bad. You know, like Newton's cradle. Yeah. You ping it here good, and then it becomes bad. And yet the tree of life is the one that sits in the middle. And that's like, uh, you know, Newton's cradle. The outside balls, good and bad, move. But the ones in the middle, they stay centered. Yeah. And and the narrow path that Jesus talks about is right in the middle. It's not too far to the right or to the left. Hence politics. It's not too far right. It's not too left. The truth is in the middle, in balance. 
Yeah, and this and this is what the, the Buddha said. He said, look, the Buddha said this so beautifully. He said, I was walking by and there was a guitarist, a sitarist. And he said, look, the strings were too tight, so they broke. And then he said, then I observed that they were too floppy and they couldn't play. Somewhere in the middle. You know, and I call this the middle path, the tree of life. Everything starts in the center. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's all about that balance, doing what you can to stay on that, yeah. on that, on that straight and narrow. And, um, and there's a lot of scriptures that talk about this path or this highway through the forest and the, it's called the highway of holiness, a lot of different names for it and stuff. But I believe it is about that path of balance and not getting like, this is, it's this place where, you know, you are before it's like, this is God. This isn't, this is Jesus. That isn't. And so now you're able to look at your demons. You're able to look at your darkness and see Jesus. You see them. They're, they're connected to God. They does. They don't exist. If God doesn't allow them to exist, like they have a purpose in a place in a job, everything in your life happened for a reason, you know? And so to become like to move in that place of oneness versus left, right? No, it's all one. And we're a part of this. And, and the things that the enemy meant for your harm, God is in turn going to use for your good. Like, listen, you know, you needed that to happen. It's a, it's a, you know, it's cause and effect. That's, that's part of it too. You know, the pendulum uh, is very much a, a symbol of spiritual awakening of moving back and forth and back and forth and what is God and what is beautiful and what is lovely versus what isn't. Um, let me ask you about this. Um, with spiritual awakening, with esoteric philosophies and uh, you know, Kundalini, I mean, all of these different ideas that are new to us, um, coming from like a, you know, um, Western tr tradition or coming from a religious tradition. Uh, did you ever experience any form of psychosis? Maybe with the pendulum of going back and forth is was really bad for me, but any type of like psychosis or life isn't real reality, was it ever hard for you? Um, navigating through this stuff you know what i had i had 18 months when i first got married in my first year i had 18 months of what i what i experienced was the climax of duality the climax in my head of duality and what i mean by that is lucifer good bad sinner no clean pure yeah just the two pendulums swinging in my head and for 18 months i experienced the most intense emotional pressure. Is it because you had a decision to make, like where you, like your future, your destiny, what, you know, what no, you were going to no, align yourself was, with? Or? No, it was because it, I felt that all of the indoctrination, because like, like I said, you know, being at the age of five, I was schooled in a very strict Catholic school. And then I went to a preschool when I was a uh, senior. So it was the accumulation of all the dogma, and then, and then the release of it, and then this liberation from it, thinking, hey, I'm one. All this stuff is, it just dissolved in a second, by the way. Yeah. But it, it, it took 18 months. I was <laughs> swinging. You know, I was like this. I was literally the pendulum. Yeah, me too. I'm in. I'm yeah. out. I mean, it, it's horrendous, man. It was horrendous. That's crazy. Truly horrendous. Yeah. Would you consider that uh, a form of the dark night that you went through? I, I okay, I'm going to be straight with you. I would c consider it a sickness of the mind. The, 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 the toxicity of what doctrina indoctrination wow. does to someone who's just childlike. You know, and Jesus you says very clearly, he says, become like a child. Yeah. You know, and um, I, I don't think... You're like purging, purging the religious dogmas and you got sick in order to get out to... to to release it 18 months bro it took yeah. me you know and um i had at one point i was driving in the car and look i was a fit guy right so i was fit I was training but inwardly i was going through this dark time and then suddenly all my faculties i got paralyzed i couldn't drive anymore and i was hospitalized and there i was laying in a bed in hospital with all these machines on me checking me out and they were saying, there's nothing wrong with you. And I couldn't even move my arm. I was completely paralyzed. And, and all I could feel was this duality, this, this dark duality going on inside of me, you know. And I knew there and then that this, I was going to die or it was going to dissolve. 
get dissolved. Yeah, I've been there, man. <laughs> it was uh, pretty crazy having that pendulum. I talk about like trying to come out of, I was a Christian evangelist. I was a gospel rapper and shared my story, how God changed my life and pulled me out of witchcraft and all this kind of stuff. As a teenager, I was into a lot of dark arts and just occultic stuff and didn't have the uh, the lifestyle that is conducive with spirituality, meditation. Like I was, you know, we would in gang, was in gang activity and I would steal from people and rob people and do any drugs that I could do. But then we're doing angel magic and ceremonial magic mixed with that. And I felt like when I tapped into the other side, about, about killed me. Cause I got to see like the kind of energies that I was entertaining. Like when you tap in, like through meditation, breath work, yoga, you're going to get to see a lot of that stuff if you're, if you're trying to, and I was definitely trying to, but Gave my life to Christ, and I came back to the Lord in 2000. Been walking with them ever since. And uh, started uh, off as a Christian rapper, Christian evangelist, traveling to churches and youth groups, speaking to hundreds of kids and telling them my story. But then the, my spiritual awakening got deeper through fasting, through prayer. Like I would get more out of laying at home on my face fasting on a Sunday morning than going to church. It kind of got into that kind of thing. And it becomes really real to you. And you're not satisfied with the status quo because you've tasted the divine and you've seen something beautiful. And so I just begin to go deeper and deeper and deeper into my studies and the Kundalini yoga and all of this other stuff. It, it opened up so much for me. UFOs, angels, like it really opened up a whole new world that really made the Bible real for me, to be quite honest. It made everything real. It wasn't heaven isn't some place you go when you die. Like the angels aren't just in another realm. Like crazy stuff that blew my mind and um but it was good beautiful but i was still this christian minister you know wow. like i had to i had a role but i was i didn't have nobody to talk to i would call in the podcast i would listen to shows like these and trying to hey man when you meditate do you see a light when you meditate when you go really deep into meditation i would ask these questions that i didn't have a teacher you know we're, we're in the bible belt there's not a lot of people talking about this stuff so i went to the internet and um, as I begin to be more comfortable and put these experiences in my music and do podcasts about them early on, still as a Christian minister, like I started catching, you know, backlash and gossip and stuff like that, which really, uh, you know, took a toll on me. And I had to kind of make that decision of where my future would take me. Am I going to, to, you know, say yes to the things that I believe God is calling me to? Like, I believe he's calling me to study plant medicine. He's calling me to meditation, beautiful music. That's not Christian. That just does something for my spirit. And I feel connected when I listen to this music, but it's not Christian. Like this kind of stuff, all of it, the pendulum of maybe 18 months. I don't know the exact time, but, um, but I, I was going crazy. Like, uh, because like one day, I would be, you know what, I'm going to be a Christian minister. I'm not going to talk about anything occultic. Jesus changed my life and I need to pay this forward for other people. And I would get rid of stuff. Like I would, anything that I had, you know, mala beads, crystals, I'd throw everything away. Books, esoteric books and posters and stuff, I'd throw it away. And then the next day I'd go try to get it out the garbage, you know, and just a lot of crazy stuff. But over that time, like it, it got into, I got real manic and real weird because like I would, I would make those shifts. It's a mental thing, right? In your mind, once you're okay with it and then you're not okay. Like I would do it, man, maybe in the same minute. I would wow. do it within the same month, the same week, same day, the same hour, but then the same minute I was back and forth. Like, you know what? I'm going to do the things God has called me to, to really, you know, look into this stuff and then nope, can't do it can't do it and I would like change my entire website like I have my website and I would redo my website leave it up for three hours and then redo the whole website again so it would go from an esoteric mysticism site to a Christian how to find Jesus website like within the same hour and this would happen for days bro and it was just like I would try to repent I would get all of this stuff away I would cry Sorry. seek the Lord in tears take these desires from me. I don't want them if they're not of you. And then my Christian friends would receive me. They'd let me come to their church. They'd pray with me and stuff. But then I would feel like I was turning my back on God because I really felt in my, in my core that God was calling me back to these things, which I started from and to see him in it. And wow. it was, uh, that pendulum, man, lasted wow. for a while and it was crazy. And it was, it wasn't until I grabbed that, I grabbed it, 
and said, no, we're not going back and forth anymore. I am okay with who I am, the person that God has made me, who he's called me to be. Yes, I'm into plant medicine. Yes, I'm madly in love with Jesus. Yes, I believe in this. Yes, I believe in that. And you can't kick me out. You know, you didn't invite me to this, so you can't kick me out. And to be okay, open and authentic in my skin. Well, haven't been the same since. I've well, never looked back. I'm it's crazy. It was, I barely made it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I'm really, I'm really, really happy to hear that because yeah. you know what, Derek? Not a lot of people do make it out. Yep. You know, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people spin the other way and never recover. Yeah. You know, well done, man. It took a lot of courage to do that. Yeah, for sure. And so for us just having this conversation, being open and honest about our talks of how like it's embarrassing. Like I was very embarrassing going through that. And people say, hey, I want people like would go to my website. Hey, I seen your site. And then like an hour later, it was a it was different. You OK, man? You bipolar? Kind of, you know. Yeah. Going through it right now. <laughs> Have grace. <laughs> no, I, 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 my manifestations, I wept. I literally looked. So yeah. I would. Be in, I'd be in the car with my wife and I'd say, stop the car, I need to cry. Yeah. And the tears would last five, six hours. Wow. And I'm nice. not joking you, man. I'm being really serious. Yeah. I would be crying six, seven hours a day for 18 months. You know, and uh, like I said, I, I got to the point where I was completely paralyzed, lay in a hospital. And then like you, I just thought, I can't do this anymore. I had I, something... I had something happen. I don't yeah, yeah. with my body too. I don't know what it was. I was driving my truck and it was going through all of this. And I, when I was working and I just, I had an allergic reaction. I've never had it before. never had it since, but I'm driving and I start sweating and start getting hives all over my body. My lips swole up real big, ears puffed up, eyes, and it was hard to breathe. And I'm driving my, and I didn't do anything. Nothing bit me. I didn't eat anything crazy. And, uh, and just had this weird reaction, but it was like kind of like at the height of all of that stuff. And in my mind, you know, demons were attacking me and I needed to cut off all relations with any witches I've interviewed or psychics or, you know, people talking about the Kundalini and stuff like that. Because that's the first thing we go to. Like we start for some reason and a lot of people do that. You start getting rid of stuff in your life that's not Christian. Or, you know, doesn't reflect Christ. Is this not, this is not of God. I got to get rid of it. And you start throwing away stuff. And uh, there's people in the comment sections talking about getting tarot cards and stuff like that. Listen, when you're on the, when the pendulum, the tarot cards is the first thing to go. You throw those away and then you go buy them again or you get them out the garbage or whatever. It's just this weird place. And people are there now. I'm reading in the comments. People are saying like they're, they're on that edge of the pendulum right now going through this stuff. But there's hope, right? There's hope. And you know what? The, the thing is, look, if, if you listen to our stories, we had to make a decision to be true and authentic to ourselves. God calls us to be you. You are. There's only you on this planet. So the reason you're designed that way is because that's what you're the gift. The way you are is a gift. So when you know that you are what you are is a gift, then there's only one thing is to be yourself. But but that takes courage. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. You know, if you're in the body of Christ and they're putting you one way and, and, and the spirit of God inside of you is calling you another way, you have to make a choice. But once you do and you start walking in that direction, liberation happens. Yeah, um, I, I got I became envious of that because I was able to read that and see that in others who were like open, honest and authentic with just who they are. Um, and there was a couple people just in my, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast a lot and I just felt like he was like, you know, one episode is this, the other one's that, you know, from this place of the healer or the guru, like you can only see one side of them. You know what I'm saying? They can only be that versus mm -hmm. this and that and that and be okay with it. Joe Rogan don't give a damn, you know, you know, it is all of him. And then he was just one example, but it, there was other people in more spiritual, um, who showed you different sides of, of who they are. And I think that comes from the church thing. You know, I would look at, you know, leaders and stuff and we're like really big on like, you know, tearing them down when they fall. Like if a, if a leader if shows you a chink in their armor or their humanity, then aha, we knew that you weren't, you're an imposter. You, you're not this holy man that you claim to be. And then, then you come to a realization that, yeah, they're not, they're regular human, human beings, you know, but they've, they're open and honest, but they're, 
you know, mindful in, in, in it all, or at least they should be. And so much to it than, than just this, you know, true, facade, I guess, of, of a religious idea. It's true. So, uh, anybody in the comment section, there's a lot of, uh, conversation going on, but if anybody has any questions for Steve, uh, let me know here while we got a few more minutes. Um, so we talked about angels and having these beautiful angel encounters. Have you uh, had any what we would call demonic encounters or like scary attacks or whatever? Obviously, that pendulum attack seems pretty scary. But as far as like maybe dealing with entities that appear or being able to feel a presence of fear and those kind of things. Did you experience it at the beginning? Because a lot of people like that's a lot of people's introduction early on dealing with their own demons that are manifest outside of them through other people. Those kind of things. Did you have any encounters with demons? I, you know what, when I was in Indonesia, I was looking, I was training in the jungle and I was, uh, this is the one I can remember the most. And I was, I was with this guy who was a painter and I was playing with his kids outside. It must've been 11 o'clock at night. And they went into hysterics and I was looking, I was thinking, why are they screaming? And then all of a sudden they were pointing and I kid you not, there was a, there was a lady that was in it was spirit form. She, she had complete white hair and she was levitating. And this was out in the sticks because I was, I was literally looking at a studio, uh, one of these painter studios that was out in the sticks where he goes to draw. So anyway, his kids were screaming. I turned around and this lady was levitating with complete white hair. And then she turned and looked at me. And, you know, at that point, I thought, this can't be real, man. This is... This can't be real, but it was. It was because there was nothing in the Bible or nothing in my esoteric knowledge head that I'd come across this thing. So anyway, there, there, there she was looking at me and I was looking at her. And I just, I just felt compelled just to send her a wave of compassion. And she just turned away and carried on. So anyway, afterwards, the guy, the painter guy was like, no, you shouldn't have looked her in the eye. Because if you did, she's got a curse. When I came, eventually a couple of days came round, I, I spoke to my wife, who's from the Philippines, and she said, yeah, yeah, I know who that is. That's this particular spirit that walks around in the jungle. She's got white hair. And this was in Indonesia. And my wife knew it. So that was, that was an encounter I had. But you know what? It didn't have a presence of evil. Mm -hmm. it, was, it just felt like someone who was floating around, just, just floating around. So, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, what was evil to someone else just because they didn't understand or they had lore behind it? You know, you was able to kind of see see it with compassion in the eyes of intrigue even, you know. Um, there's something about like when the supernatural becomes natural, when entities cross over. You know, we, we're around a lot of people who do a lot of inner work and out-of-body experiences or ascensions where they kind of go within and go to heaven and talk to angels in their mind and stuff like that. Like, that's cool. Like I'm all for that, but there's something different when you're doing this work and an angel appears like, or a demon, whatever, just when something breaks through the veil of reality and you get to see it, like yeah. there's so much imparted. I feel like with faith and with creativity and that, Hey, this stuff is real. Um, you know, even if they are scary experiences, that something is real, maybe the afterlife or the spirit world that just kind of like confirms some things for you. So it's so interesting to me. And, and I got into like going through that awakening and stuff. I was really big and looking up stuff on UFOs and um, uh, yeah. some I've seen videos of people summoning UFOs using the Bible yeah. and they would go yeah, out yeah. and they would hold their hands up to the sky and ask for, you know, the, the chariots of fire to come through and say hello in, in these orbs would appear and lights in the sky and I was like it blew my mind I started going out doing that and then to have it happen you know I spent hours and hours in research and all of this stuff and you know diet devotion like everything like I'm gonna make this happen and it happened like I'm out like making contact and they would show up like what I didn't close my eyes and see them like they literally would pop out of of portals and wormholes and come out of stars and go into constellations just stuff that'll blow your mind like you'd never be the same after seeing that you know now what what is it you know that's up for up for the bait for me it was the angelic but what that did for me and my music and my awakening and 
the reality of the spirit world for me it just changed everything man you know you would would you say that ezekiel in the one of the prophets in the old testament saw a very similar thing one of those chariots some people would yeah some yeah. people would say that i think i said that at first i now as i've done more research i really think ezekiel's wheel is the sun moving through the houses of the zodiac the wheel within the wheel with all okay. of the other eyes being the stars. So there's a lot of astrology, even astrology, something that's scary for a lot of Christians to look into astro theology, which is the Bible is full of it. Um, but there are definitely UFO experiences in the Bible what, of chariots of fire. What about Elijah going into a chariot? Elijah, one of the biggest ones for me of like just being able to see them and being able to take people with you um, was when you hear about, um, um, Elisha and, and the young man who they woke oh, yeah. up and they had a whole army that was invading them and hey we're gonna die the young man woke up scared to death hey this is it we're dead man he said hold on there's more that are for us than that than are against us and he lays hands on them and asks God to open his sight so that he can see the angel armies and he was able to see chariots of fire all around the mountains around them that were more than the army so that of this prayer that allowed him to see what was there in the spirit so definitely you know something like that like you know being able to see them or or you know train your eye to see them even um but yeah the bible's full of you know god you know traveling and and, and oh the israelites being led through through the wilderness as a uh, following a cloud by day and a fire by yep. night this fire that's like moving through the sky and a lot of similar experiences, but for me, it became real. Like it wasn't like a like this imaginary place that you go to or they exist in your head. Like like they're out there somewhere, you know, the, the angels and and stuff. And so we can interact with them and communicate and stuff. And that's just one thing. But for me, like man, that was a huge part of my awakening. You know, beautiful changes your life. Um, Dave wants to know, he says, I'm interested to know if Steve believes in universal salvation uh, that includes all entities, including any idea of Satan or a devil. Does everything kind of get reconciled in the end and make it to heaven or Summerland or whatever you believe? <laughs> <laughs> you know, ultimately, um, Lucifer cannot exist without the permission of God. Okay. Um, whether free will has a role to play, I don't know. But, you know, if whosoever, I, I believe that any entity, if he's away from the absence of God's love, will suffer. And I feel that if any entity wants to journey back home, I believe that God's love is big enough to, to accept any entity from any species, from any creature, from any sphere, from any dimension. You know, so I hope that answers it maybe, but that's only, that's only my theory, right? <laughs> it's only my theory. These are just, these are just theories, but that's what I believe. I believe that God's love is eternally majestically big enough to bring everyone back. Yeah. And I, I could quantify that with a text. David said, there I am in the hell, but God's love's with me. There yeah. I am in Hades and there is God's love. So you know where that I can go to get away from his 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 presence. Um you know that's a, that's a growing idea uh even in Christendom a lot of people are moving away from the idea of eternal torments. Um whether it's through you know reading the scriptures or for me it was like a natural thing because I didn't know where it was in the scriptures but the, the more you're in God's love and you're in that stillness and you're experiencing the beauty and the bliss of life and creation you're like this same God will destroy me if I denied his existence, like forever. He'll burn me and torment. He created me to torment me because he knew that I would deny him. Like that becomes like, so like it just, it's, it leaves your theology early on. So there's a lot of people in this awakening who are abandoning, abandoning the idea of an eternal torment. Even if someone to hold on to that, they'll hold on to the idea that it, it, it is just only for, a certain amount of time like there's a pure yeah. fire is purification and you have to your soul must pass through that or you get punished for the type of sins that you've committed or they get burnt out of you whatever but it's only for a p short period of time versus forever and ever weeping and gnashing of teeth in a lake, lake of fire <laughs> that's true 
Yes, yeah, so that's, that's one of the beautiful things. And there's a lot of people waking up to that. Um, one thing about the fire, too, you're talking about how, like, um, you know, showing people in the scriptures how, you know, we are to engage with the elements and stuff. I mean, we see a lot of stuff with that, with Jesus talking to the wind and talking to the waves and stuff like that. There's an interesting scripture in the Old Testament where uh, uh, there was a prophet named Manoah and they built a fire and an angel comes through the fire and communicates with them. And it says it goes back. It gives them a message, goes back into the fire and travels to heaven. That's for me, that's an idea of like the element of fire that they're communicating with. The word angel just means a messenger, like this messenger appeared to me through the fire. So I believe that just like in Eastern thought, they're practicing a form of fire gazing or, you know what I'm saying, fire scrying where you're staring into the fire and you're, you're getting messages and you're communicating with the element of fire. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. But, you know, I, I see everything as interconnected to the one. So if everything is inter- interconnected to the one, then everything can be used for the one. Yep. I, I don't see any separation. You yeah. see, so this, do you know what I mean, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all, uh, it's all, um, it's all your perception. There's levels of consciousness that, you know, and I think experience is, experience is what like opens you up to know it deep down. Like you can have an idea or, or have a theory that you can't prove, but there's like this, a difference of this inner knowing once you experience it. Like there's no way that you can tell me that, you know, I was out there summoning demons in the night sky, um, you know, because I've just my path and, and, and having telepathic communication with these angels and stuff like that. For me, it's just mind blowing. And there's, you can't talk me out of it. You haven't experienced it. Like mm-hmm. there's no way, like if you have not, if you want to, you can for sure. Anybody can, if you do the work, but, um, you know, once you have that, that, those profound experiences or somebody to tell you that, you know, Kundalini yoga is, is, is demonic. Or if you, if you meditate, demons will enter your body. Or if you do yoga, you know, you're going to get possessed and stuff. It's like, you haven't done it. But at the same time, some people have, and they experienced, you know, they had a different experience than you. They did Kundalini yoga and they unlocked, you know, something in their bodies and they were plagued with Kriyas for, you know, months and had to go to church and see a therapist to get rid of it. Like everybody's experience is subjective though. I've, I've heard that I've heard that from every school, from every esoteric. And the way that I would describe that is you're either going to find balance or imbalance. You can become imbalanced by eating wrongly, by training too hard, by driving wrongly. It's, it, it can happen with anything. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and again, I guess going back to what you said, the balance right in the middle is like, if right you're too far, middle. yeah too far into any of it if there's you know people you know these things i i did an article early on and we talked about this before it was popular now now you there's thousands of articles on the internet but i remember covering these subjects when there was none and it was kind of interesting to talk about but the the, uh, relationship with the kundalini and the holy spirit being the same thing or even pranayama and the breath or the chi energy the tachyon is this life force that you can feel if you want to feel it we feel it through prayer we feel it through meditation there's all kinds of ways that you can literally feel it in your body and it's exhilarating it's beautiful it's healing it makes you feel alive um but we, we tackled this early on and, and people would say that it was demonic or whatever the case is. But um, what about you? What would you say? I mean, there's different philosophies and different ways to engage with it and, and other cultures, um, you know, have rules and regulations on it and how it operates. But for, for one, it's something beautiful. For the other, it's something demonic. What would you say to like to that energy? I, I, look, I would say it's not the energy. I would say it's the intention behind the energy. So I would always say, is where, what is your compass aligned to? Because if your compass is aligned to doing evil, then whatever you use is going to become that very thing. You see? So it really is to do with the intention. Again, you know, Jesus talks about that, and the Bible talks clearly yeah. about that. Yep. You know, the purity of your heart, the intention of your heart. You know, you, you know, that is a very beautiful thing in the old tea where the prophet Samuel comes in and he lines up. He wants to see one of the sons, the house of Jesse. And David's out playing 
and he lines up, Jesse lines up his six sons and it's not any of them. And then it's David. And then he says, and then the text says, God sees the inner heart of a person, not the outer, right? Yeah. And so I always, when someone says to me they're doing something, I never really look at what they're actually, the actual thing they're doing whether it's kundalini or yoga or prayer or fasting, I always say, but what's the intention behind yeah. it? It's now, is that, something, is that something that you have to stick around for a long time? Do you have to research their teachings and see how they treat people? Or is that something that's like, in some cases, supernatural that you can just kind of feel their energy like when you hear them speak and stuff like that? Like, oh, okay, I like what he's saying, but it's coming from a bad, a dark place. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, know, you know, I'd always say it's either coming from his true nature or his imbalanced nature. So yeah. not to judge people, but you know, it's kind of like, you know, people go off, you know, some people that have been poor, unfortunately, right? And they've had experienced poverty all their life. And they've had generations of poverty and suddenly they they have access to this thing that could probably bring them money. I'm not gonna judge them because they've been poor. You can't judge them. You don't know their life history. So I always say, look, it's that. If they mm -hmm. start here, they're most likely to go here, but yeah. eventually, just like me and you, man, we, 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 we spun, right? And eventually we came back to the middle. So yeah. in the middle, in the middle, you can play with anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I think that's, you know, discernment and again, not to cast judgment and you no. have to look at the information for what it is. But for me, it's really hard to like learn from people who can't be taught or from people who claim to, or like know-it-alls, or yeah. or even just this, I, feel, I can discern the spirit a, a lot of times, like listening to a teacher who's, a lot of, even when esoteric or Christians or whatever, they're, they're like, you can tell, because you've been there, maybe, you know, you've dealt with that spirit or essence before, it's it's operating out of offense, out, operating out of hurt, or for me, it's a, like, I, I can sense it a lot of times when esoteric teachers are like trying to like, talk about the bible but attack christianity and stuff like that yeah. like i can tell where it's coming from even if it's a little sly and it's just in the underbelly it's okay you've been you've went through a similar experience where you were maybe were a minister or whatever i can i can sense that in, in some people and so obviously the, the information is what it is but you can tell like that it's like it's almost a ba backhanded compliment or it's you know It's the intention, you know, being able to discern the intention. Like, I don't care what you're sharing. Like you said, I want to know, I can tell the intention. Do Are you coming from a good place? Like, even if you're wrong and you're making it all up, if it's coming, not making it all up, but it's just, it's not accurate. Like, it's coming from a good place, I can tell. And I want to know more. I mean, that's part of that, that childlike faith and the innocence or whatever that, uh you know, that, that people have versus, like, becoming calloused and that kind of um you know the, the uh, motives of the heart is wrong and again that's how ju god judges and that's how that's how we judge i don't give a damn what you're telling me i don't care if you're telling me how to summon ufos i don't care if you're telling me how to go in the spirit world and bring back you know increasing wealth like like why are you doing it like what is the intention and and and, and what is your spirit in, in doing it you know that that for me is the that's the essence of the essence you know i call it the line of intent that's what I call it, you know. Good stuff. What about plant medicines, man? Have you um, went on any journeys or had any awakenings through through that? Plant, plant, yeah, I have. I have a lot of friends that do. I'm a vegan, by the way, right? So you know, I. It was my, you know, it was my kids. I, I used to be a meat eater all my life, you know, and it was uh, my daughter Sarah is a professional yoga teacher, and one day she said, "Hey, Dad, listen." you've got to watch some of these videos. And, and I said, okay, fine. And I sat down and, and it was my three kids, actually, they prepared some videos and it was the way that we treat animals. And I, yeah. and I, to be honest with you, I, I hadn't paid any attention to that. Yeah. Right. And so I sat for three months watching video after video and I went, I got it all wrong. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the same applies with ayahuasca. You know, the same applies with ayahuasca. I've had friends of mine that have taken ayahuasca and come off being uh, addicted cocaine addicts all their life. I'm talking 20 years, right? And they've gone and taken ayahuasca. And there and then, they've never, 
not just released, deliver, delivered from it, they've never felt a remote desire as though their brain has been completely rebooted. Yeah. Some, right? So, no, I'm all for anything that has been produced by Mother Earth mm -hmm. is full of love. I see it all as this. So people ask me about plant medicine, and I would say, look, God's love, he prepares a table of fruit, vegetation, and herbs. And that is God's love to humanity. So if we, we, we take this plant medicine with love, we'll enter into his love. So that, that's the way that I see it. But yeah. again, it, it's based on your intention. You know, it's based on your intention. Look, I always, when I, I spent a lot of time in the jungle of Indonesia, and I started to realize, right, that when my heart was opened, that the medicines and the plants around me responded in a different way than if I was in fear and nervousness. You, 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 start, you start living in the jungle for two months and you start to realize, wait a minute, those plants are opening to me and those plants are not. Why? So I just think we're all one. Honestly, I think we're all one. We're interconnected into this love. We're extensions of God's love. So this plant medicine, I'm glad you used the word plant medicine because that's what it is. Yeah. It's God's sacred plant medicine to humanity. And I think, I think we need to go back to it. But you haven't, but but you haven't uh, have uh, you know done um, psilocybin or ayahuasca yourself? No, I've taken I've in Indonesia I've taken all forms of plant medicine. <laughs> Somebody's mentioning kratom as well. They want to know is that the same as kratom? Well, kratom. No, in, so you know in Indonesia every you li all I've had five different silat teachers. All of them used plant medicine. You know, so you know whether I was uh, if you've got a broken heart, you take something. If you can't access stillness, you'll take something. If you've got a broken elbow, you'll take something. So for me, the, the medicine that God gives us is, is one of the most incredible biological chemical miracles we have on the planet. So no, bring them on. Bring them all on. <laughs> but make sure they're used as medicine. That's my point. For sure. You know now, you know, I think a lot of people would talk about like uh, encountering the spirit of that medicine of that plant yeah. um yeah. No, you know what i'm saying no matter what it is there's a different essence some people even talk about like you know when they do it they they encounter a being that looks like a woman yeah. or whatever wearing a dress and different things like that so have you uh, with with connecting with the plants and stuff and the essence and the spirit of the plants have you ever had like those encounters like not on using plant medicine but just through like just states of meditation and connecting with the vegetation or even just saying hello my name is this do you have to ingest it do you connect with it you know on any level do you, have you experienced that okay so in in the martial art that i practice before you draw a training ground we call it the sasanan right uh you have to ask permission okay so for example when we were training in different locations in indonesia we would sit in meditation and we would ask the plants, the trees, permission. So on one occasion, I saw the guardian of the tree, which was a spirit. And as I, as I asked for permission, I saw this. And on other times, I have gone to train in certain locations and there's been a no-go. So in, in our tradition, we always, wherever we go, we always ask permission to use the location. And, and that's, that's then you uh, um, contacting the energetics behind the tree and behind the location. So this exists everywhere, man. Yeah. I, think, I think living in, a, if you ever explore the native Indians of America, yes. this is massive for them. Yeah, for sure. You know, and this is why some buildings fall because they've had no permission to build there. Mm. Some constructions, even though they're, you know, engineered properly, they have huge problems because they haven't really considered the energetics behind it, you know? This is huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, building on top of burial grounds and things like that. And, stuff like and, that, yeah, and, stuff and like that. With graves and stuff, places that are sacred to those people. Uh, but I mean, what, what would happen if, um, you know, 
if if it told you no, but it told other people yes, do you just sit out, or is it like collectively? I mean, do, do, do everyone collectively get a no when they go in like that, or? Do you know what I think? That some people are naive; they don't they don't realize. Some people are not open. You know, sometimes it's not been a a seeing; it has been more like a wave feeling. Hey, don't train here. Yeah. And there's been other times where I've 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 denied the wave, don't train, and then I've got sick the next day. Yeah. Like proper flu, you know, and, and I, you know, like a real proper flu, and yeah. I shouldn't have had one. And I think mm, I shouldn't have trained there. I should have listened. And that's been the that's been the experience of other colleagues, friends of mine that have done the same thing. You know. Awesome. That's what's up. <laughs> well, Steve, man, I've enjoyed this conversation, brother. Like, uh, thanks no for problem. hanging out with me. If you want to go ahead and share your links again, you have an esoteric school online and uh, uh yeah. you know martial arts training a bunch of really cool stuff that you bring to the table i guess go ahead again and i'll have all of that stuff in the show notes but let people know where they can pick up a copy of the book and all that cool stuff okay it's on uh stroke arts.com dash arts.com okay awesome i will link that back at the website at truthseeker.com if you go to that uh episode and see those show notes steve man hey i really enjoyed it brother thanks for hanging out with me and uh, i know we can talk for hours man but thanks yeah. for coming on hanging it'll be out great to see you one day when i i'm probably flying after this COVID. i'll probably fly in to see some of the crew in the u.s it'll be great to catch up with you for sure you. we'll thank do you. it man thank you so much brother many blessings thank to you, you. namaste thank bro you. namaste thank Shalom. you Steve Benitez, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, that was a good episode. That was a good talk. Listen, stir up the gift of God that's within you, man. Um, you know, it's it's good to uh, to hear this stuff from a different perspective, to hear other people's experiences with uh, religion, with plant medicine, with meditation, with prayer, with yoga, with the kundalini, with the Holy Spirit. Like, hear other people's um, experiences. So I'll let you know, listen, if you take that into consideration, like everybody's experience isn't the same. Some people have had beautiful experiences and then maybe some people have had not so pleasant experiences. But I do think that it comes down to the intention that you enter into anything. Some of us who are, um, I would say, a bit more, um, you know, operating as an empath, you can feel the intention. You know that something's off. You know that it's not right. And that's, that's natural, but there's ways to cultivate that. And I think that little simple ways, like Steve was talking about just before he would train or practice on, on a, a certain uh, part of, of land, asking and waiting until you get that answer. Ask the elements. You know, there's a scripture where, where God talks about, uh, in Old Testament, talks about like talking to the trees and talking to the birds and ask the, the animals and they will tell you. Like all of creation radiates the glory of God. All of it. They all sing their praise. They all communicate. And there's a difference to see if you can listen or not. See, there's a lot of people who, there's certain people you can't listen from. And listen, I kind of gave, told you straight up the people I can't listen to. but, But obviously if I was to listen, it, you know, I can learn some things. But it's hard for me to listen to people who are operating out of out of bitterness. It's hard to me who are operating out of pride. Like if I hear you, you know, mock something near and dear to my heart. Listen, it's hard for me to take you serious and and think that, you know, that you're going to mock something that's precious to other people, whether it's religion or faith or Jesus or whatever. So there's a lot of big name people in these movements that I can't listen to because they're teaching you deep esoteric knowledge, but then they mock Christians and say Christians are stupid or mock people who believe that Jesus was real. And then they'll go on to teach you esoteric mysticism. I can't I can't receive from you. I'm sorry. That's my hang up. Other people can. They love it. They receive everything you got. They want to go deeper into mysticism. That's them. That's my hang up. Other people, if you know, you're a Christian, you might not be able to learn from somebody who teaches Kundalini yoga, like Steve said. I don't know if you've come in, the, if you've made packs with ancient spirits or you're operating out of some ancient deity that is foreign or not of God or whatever. Like, so that understanding, that belief that you have hinders you from receiving. Well, I can't do Kundalini Yoga. I'll get possessed. I can't watch. I can't listen to what True Seeker says. He does 
plant medicine. He's possessed, you know? So, you know, everybody has the, the things that they can and can't listen to because you're an empath, because you can feel the intention. Everybody has their thing. You have to be able to transcend and learn from everything and everyone because everything is here to teach you. The birds, the trees, the plants, the donkey. If God can use that, he can use anything. Now that moves on from people to plants. Can the plants speak to you? Can the plants teach you? So some would some would say no. Some would say plants can't communicate. They're you know uh, inanimate objects. They're they're not alive. They're they have no nerves. They don't feel. They can't teach. They can't share. It's delusion to think that. So that those person th- those people would never uh, acquire of the plants. They would never try to to talk to them. They would never uh, open their 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 ears to listen to all of the things that they have to say, whether it's a spiritual um, path or a quite uh, physical path of, you know, their connection to you as a human. Like if I make a connection with turmeric and uh, I know what it does to my body when we become one, when I digest it, it, there's a relationship. Turmeric uh, has a lot of beautiful benefits. And you just move out to all of them and then get into plant medicine and then get into whatever they are, you know, whether it's something really deep or something that you uh, partake of every day. And you have this relationship with the plants. Can you hear the voice of the plants? Yeah, you can. If you listen, can you speak with the tongues of the angels? Yeah, but you need to. You need to have love. You need to walk in love. And that's, I feel like, what enables you to do that. There's a tongue of the angels. I feel like that tongue is also part of our light language or speaking in tongues, as some would say, which we practice and do. So all of that has its place of being able to have that conversation. If you can't talk to someone because they're different than you on the earth, Damn if you're fixing to talk to angels, if you're fixing to talk to enlightened beings, because you can't even talk to your brother who is made in the image of God, whether because they have a different, let's not even go into different religious beliefs, philosophical beliefs. Let's don't get into Christian Hindu. Let's get into Baptist, Protestant, you know, Baptist, uh, evangelical, charismatic. Y'all believe this. We believe that y'all are wrong. You know, there's even within the religion, there's these breakdowns of these schisms and things that separate you apart and you can't talk to them. You can't find the commonality and go deeper within it. Maybe you can, but they can't. But listen, God is speaking through everything and everyone. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. God is using everything and everyone. So you have to train yourself to hear God in it, to see God in it. Just because you can't see. And and when listening to other people's stories, man, you can learn a lot. Don't act like you got it all figured out. Listen, listen, don't be judging, judging stuff that you don't know or you feel like, you know, and uh, listen, that's (laughs) that's elementary. Like you got to get rid of that ASAP. You got to get rid of that ASAP to be able to ascend to the higher levels, to be able to facilitate beautiful experiences, not just for yourself, but for others to be one that those beautiful experiences follow, to be able to set people free, to be able to set yourself free. You have to overcome. You have to transcend your judgments. If you're not going to talk to or believe in, you know, it's people who can't even talk to people who have a different political affiliation, you know. Because the indoctrination is so thick. You got to overcome. Talk to them. Hear them out. Not to, not to, you know, agree to disagree. Not to feel, listen, I don't even want, honestly, like, you know, it's not, I don't even think it's about like arguing or having debates or trying to convince people anymore for me. Like it used to be that. But now, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Um, as if I can teach you anything, it's the Holy Spirit that would teach you anything through me to begin with. And if you ain't ready for it, I don't want to take you down through there, you know, but I think if you're listening to a podcast like this, that you're open 
to ask the bigger questions in life. You're for trying to look for these experiences and you want to have them for yourself and you want to facilitate them for people. And so that's, I think that's a, a, a great place to begin. And, uh, and that's all it takes to that qualifies you that you want it. You know, I talk about like, I was privileged to see the, you know, things that I've seen for sure. I was open. I wanted to, are you open? Do you want to? And if the and if the answer is yes, then you're qualified. Just say yes to whatever it is. And you can do it. Those meditations, the breath work, the oneness. Seeing Christ in everything is a beautiful place to start. Once I can find some free time, hopefully this week, I've been talking about it, but I'm going to um, cover... I'm going to read a story out of this book, The Ways of the Lonely Ones, and I'll put it up on my YouTube channel. But it's a story that Manly P. Hall wrote about uh, the face of Christ, where this guy was walking through the wilderness and had this uh, experience where he saw the face of Christ in this beautiful, mystical experience. And then everywhere that he went after that, he was able to see the face of Christ. He looked into the trees. He saw the face of Christ. He looked into the water. He looked into his lover's eyes. Every, he looked into the stars and he saw the face of Christ. And I think that that's key is to be able to see God in everything. See the beauty in everything. See the, see the duality. See the deception. See the, you know, and have compassion for that. Not to change that, but just to see the person and honor their journey, man. Honor their journey. Listen, I know you don't agree with me. Listen, I wouldn't agree with me either, especially 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I wouldn't have agreed with me either. I would have did a video exposing you. I would have called you every name in the book. I would have messaged people who comment on all of your, your Facebook posts and tell, tell them to stay away from you like because I, I was doing the, the, the work of the Lord was to warn the people from this witchcraft, from this debauchery. This is not of God. So you have compassion because you've been there. You got to, you know, you've been there too. So you might be there right now, wherever it is, man, just see yourself in those people is to be able to see Christ, put yourself in their shoes. That's practicing mindfulness to understand why would they do that? Okay. Listen, things shifted for me. That was probably one of the, the early things for me that helped things to shift is to put myself in other people's shoes. To be honest with you, a lot of it started with 9-11 of just going deeper into like whether well, it's conspiracies. But the back end of that was to put my myself in these people's shoes, not in 9-11. But when we went into Iraq, Iran and Afghanistan, put in my I seen footage of what that looked like and putting myself in those people's shoes who were, quite frankly, innocent. You know, it's like, man, that opened up something for me. And then dealing with people from other religions and what they believe and what they've been taught to see what makes us different, but to put myself in their shoes. And then eventually got to the point where I'm like, listen, I don't care about what makes us different. There's a lot of stuff that makes us different. What makes us the same? And that's what Christianity won't teach you because it takes the exclusivity away to say, listen, let's find what we can agree on. I know we're different. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a peculiar people. I'm a little bit different. You know, all of it. We know these scriptures, but what makes us the same? Well, we're having the same human experience, the, the human plight. It's very similar for everyone. Everyone wants to feels disconnected. They want to be loved and accepted. And it leads to other things. It leads to lashing out. It leads to looking for acceptance and and whatever is there that it's going to be there for you and not let you down. Like the, the human experience is very similar, regardless of your religion. People tap into the religion to try to, you know, aid or uh, bring some some clarity to this ex existence. So it's putting yourself in, in their shoes and just listening to people. I'm telling you, it changed your life. Listen to those stories, all of them, all the stories. And then you'll find out that if you listen to enough, then there's like, there's some disagreements. There's some schisms. There's people who had beautiful encounters with Kundalini yoga. There's people who had terrifying encounters with Kundalini yoga. There's people who had beautiful and have beautiful experiences with the Catholic church. There's people who have had terrifying experiences with the Catholic Church, 
with your local church, with your pastor, with the things that you love and the things that you believe in. There's some people who feel the same way. There's other people who despise that system, that church, that denomination, that school of thought. So, which leads you to what Adam says here in the chat. Shout out Adam. What up, boy? He says, love, honor, and respect is the answer. Having respect, love, and honor. And not just to say that, but to really go above and beyond to do it. Like We can say it, but to do it. It's not in word, but in deed. That you step out and do it. I'm going to respect you. Well, what's that mean? I'm going to honor you. What does that mean? Is it just to say it? And is, that, is that a salute? An I see you salute? Or is that a partnering with? Is that like, I don't care that I'm going to get judged for like, bump, bumping shoulders with you of like, or giving you a platform or, you know what I'm saying? That's big, <laughs> especially in Christendom. Love, honor, and respect is not like coming into alignment with what you believe. You know, it is loving you from a distance. That's what love, honor, and respect respect means to most Christ, uh, Christians. <laughs> it's loving you from a distance. It's praying for you, brother. It's all of that. So, but really, man, to embody the stuff, not in word, but in deed. I think it's a currency. I don't do it because I get to do what I do. Um, I do it because you're worth it. You know, you really are. And I think that it opens up doors for me um, when I tap in, when I go before the Father, when I ask of something, when I ask for his love, when I ask for his forgiveness to wash over me. Because it comes in waves and sometimes you feel rejected. Sometimes you feel bad. Sometimes you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. You don't know which side, which way is up and which way is down. And you had that, you felt okay yesterday. So I need a little bit more of that love and of that grace. And it's like, okay, well, are you extending that? As long as you're extending it, like God will continually pour that out for you because you're extending it for others. But when you're asking for things that you won't give out freely, freely receive, freely re will give it, you know, you have to, in order for you to walk in forgiveness and, and be forgiven, you have to forgive. It ain't worth it. Whatever offense that you've been through, no matter what you've, uh, people who have wronged you, that offense, that bitterness is not worth hanging on to it. Uh, that, that unforgiveness won't, you know, that you're harboring unforgiveness and, and forgiveness won't freely flow through you to you. There's levels of it, ladies and gentlemen. There's levels to it. You're not just once forgiven and now I'm good. Like there's levels of grace. There's levels, I think, even of, you know, when you say fallen nature or sin nature or whatever, there's levels of, of, of horror. There's levels of the, the, the bad things that humans are capable of, like but where sin abounds, where the, the deepest, darkest depths of, of what uh, hatred and sin looks like, their grace also abounds much more. So there's waves in that. There's levels to that. And even in this experience, in this journey, it's like, you know, letting God wash over you with his love, with his grace, with his forgiveness for all of it. And a part of it is letting it go or owning up to it. Yeah, I messed up. Yeah, that wasn't good. I'm sorry. Are you remorseful? Are you repentant? Like that's, that's, it's, you know, I think the, the, um, God's love and forgiveness enables you to be repentant and repentance, not just feeling sorry because that's just your humanity. That's just that you're in touch, that you know that you messed up and you feel sorry. The repentance is, I'm not going to do it again. And that's just this life. Like, how do you know how it feels to do that unless you do it? So a lot of us, we've done some really messed up things. And so we want forgiveness. But is that forgiveness enough to move you to repentance? It's having a change of, of mind, having a change of heart. Listen, I'm not doing it again. And then you find yourself like the Apostle Paul. The things that I don't want to do, I keep finding myself doing. How do I stop doing these things? How do I get out of this cycle? And uh, 
and it, and, and one thing about it is really to what we've been talking about this whole episode is just tapping into the love of God, the unmerited grace is unmerited favor that God has for you. It's the, the love and the oneness with all creation, with the universe, with everything and with God, that it is inside of you, that it is outside of you. And to just, to simply breathe this, to, to uh, soak it in. And because you know how close that you are with God, that you know how close you are with the father, the son, the Holy spirit, the love, the demons, the angels, the insects, the, um, entities that are uh, microscopic living on your body all of this everything the song and dance of this life the oneness of it all it is love that you get to experience this and to know that and go go deeper into it deeper into it deeper into it i think it opens up things in your mind we've been calling these gateways that you have to pass through of of consciousness even um levels that if you un- you cannot understand uh, you know, something on a ninth grade level, if you haven't been to the third and fourth grade, there's things that you have to get that at ninth grade, we're going to take it to another level. So these are veils. These are things that you must pass through in, in this mystery school that we are all inducted in. And I'm not the, I'm not the leader. I'm not the teacher. It's the Holy spirit on all of them, you know, but he allows you to be taught by other things and other people or, um, what seems to be a persona, but it's really in order for you to get it. It's the Holy spirit that has to reveal it to you as the true teacher. And you need not any man to teach you. You're in this school, you're learning, you're taking the tests. You're going to be quizzed pop quiz. You have to respond with love, honor and unity. And that's how you pass it all. What Adam said, love, honor, and respect. If you have those three, Nothing can stop you. Do you, uh, you? Nothing is off limits to you. That's your access card. That's your key card. That you love. That you honor. That you walk in respect. <sighs> Bring it with you, man. Bring it to your breath work. Bring it to your yoga. Bring it to you when you listen to music. Bring it to when you're when you're creating something. When you're writing. Uh, when you're having a conversation. Bring it. Love, honor, respect. That's a plumb line. I believe it. With that, I'm going to say peace and shalom, man. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. I enjoyed this episode, man. A lot of really cool topics we touched on. And uh, I really resonate with, with Steve. And hopefully I can meet him when he comes to the States. Would be awesome. Um, for those of you who uh, want to get on get in on our Thursday night sessions, uh, make sure you become a patron. The link is below. You get access to a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, new music's coming out. And i um, working on some new stuff. And a lot of that's available on Patreon already. Uh, our December trip is coming up. For those of you who want to hit the wilderness with us and uh, and have a experience, encounter all the infos on the website, truthseeker.com. December the 12th, there are two female tickets left. Um, so if you want to get in on that, make sure you purchase a ticket. Let's see what else we got coming up. I can really just talk about the Path of the Healer course that I, I launched Um and uh, I, I'm enjoying taking um, individuals through my process that that I had to go through. And um, it, it's been amazing to see them um, step up to the plate and say yes to want to be sent out and to do the greater works, to, to be sent out and trained as healers, but then to have their own uh, businesses and be able to step out and do sessions and make a, make a living off of their passion blogging, podcasting, creating videos, and just teaching people to go through this process. Uh, it's been amazing. And so we are two weeks deep into that and I'm excited because we're going deeper every week with these teachings and stuff that, uh, I pretty much mapped out my spiritual process and gave it everything I had worked on this stuff for two weeks, uh, two months and, um, has been beautiful. So it's awesome. We may open it back up again. There may be access to get get in on some of the meditations in the end or something like that. I'm not really 100% sure, but we're doing that eight week program. It's been phenomenal. Thank you. Thanks everyone who who signed up for that and said yes to your calling, man. Who said yes to your destiny and are ready to uh, to see some fruit 
from all of the stuff that you've been learning to be raised up and sent out. That's really what it's about. And everybody who wasn't able to make it like this, we're doing it regardless. Like, you know, through everything that we put out, you're being trained, you're being sent out, you're being encouraged, you're being helped, like all of it. So just know that there's different levels to it, man. And just thank you for no matter what level you show up at, just show up, right? If it's into in, into what I'm doing or anyone or just enabling you to do what you're doing you're calling if that's to love if that's to teach if that's just to encourage people within our community uh it goes a long way so thanks everybody for for playing your role and showing up so uh with that being said i'm gonna say peace and shalom man really enjoyed it uh we got another episode tonight we're gonna go dark we're gonna go dark tonight we're gonna be talking to horror core artist shy 361 formerly known as shy one He's been away for 10 years. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's into some really interesting stuff as well. Um, Really into like mystical, prophetic stuff. And uh, it's going to be fun to talk to him. And uh, we're going to talk about hip hop and music and horror movies and Halloween and stuff like that. Just because that's where we are, man, a couple of days away. So if you want to talk about maybe some ghost stories and the paranormal and things that go bump in the night, which, hey, is a veil that many of you have passed through or have to pass through to get into the deep, deeper stuff. You got to face your darkness, man. It's going to be good. With that, I'm going to say peace and shalom. See y'all soon. Peace. Yo, so much That does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.